Okay, thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Feminist Perspectives at Time of the Writer 2023. Uh, I'm very excited to be moderating this panel with an illustrious lineup of uh, women from both South Africa and further afield. First up, we have um, Dr. Benita Mulman, who is the Associate Professor in African Fem Feminist Studies at the University of Cape Town. She previously worked at the Human Sciences Research Council as a postdoc and senior research specialist for several years. And she's co-editor of the collection, Racism, Violence, Betrayals, and New Imaginaries, Feminist Voices, which was published last year. Then we have Oksana Lut Lutsishina, who is a Ukrainian writer, translation, translator, and poet. She's authored three novels, a collection of short stories, and five books of poetry. Her latest novel, Ivan and Phoebe, was awarded the Lviv City of Literature UNESCO Prize in 2020 and the Taras Shevchenko National Award in Fiction in 2021. She holds a PhD in Comparative Literature and is currently Assistant Professor of Practice in Ukrainian Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Next up is Nadine Dirks. And Nadine is an activist, author, um, prolific writer, opinion maker, and communications expert. Her work interests and expertise lie, expertise lie in intersectional feminism, gender, and sexuality, and include sexual and reproductive health and rights, especially of marginalized people. She's an author, public speaker, moderator, and panelist, and she hopes to bring people out from the margins and into the center of their own narratives. Her work has been re recognized internationally, for example, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and she's passionate about creating a more equal and sustainable society. She's the author of the forthcoming book, Hot Water, which looks at her own experiences of endometriosis and the discrimination found in the public healthcare system in South Africa. And last but not least, Dr. Nadia Sanger works as a lecturer in the Department of English Studies at Stellenbosch University. Her research straddles the arts, humanities, and social sciences, and she has a particular interest in critical race theory, feminist studies, and African futurism. She's particularly focused on the potential of story to theorize, and is co-editor of this brilliant collection, Racism, Violence, Betrayals, and New Imaginaries, Feminist Voices, together with Dr. Norman. She is also one of the co-editors of the book Feeling Lives, an intersectional exploration of past experiences and present living, which is due to be published later this year. So welcome everybody and welcome out there to any members of the audience and the public who I hope are following and listening and going to be interacting with us. The first thing I'd like, like to ask each of you to comment on, please, is how your specific work has intersected with other forms of discrimination, either in your workplace, in your research, or in your creative endeavors such as writing. And I'm going to begin there with you, Benita, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, thanks, Aisha. Um, hi, everyone. Phew. Okay, so I'm like, how far back do I go, right? So I used to work at Rape Crisis. Um, and so I was based in the, it was at the time called the Heidefeld office. I developed Manenberg office. Um, and I was interested in, at Rape Crisis, I was interested in, so of course the focus is around gender and sexuality at Rape Crisis, right? Uh, and I was interested in sort of looking beyond the idea, I suppose, of what would be constituted as sort of universal programs and universal programmatic interventions on rape. Being based uh, on the Cape Flats, I was interested in gang rape. And I was thinking, what are we doing as an organization um, to intervene in the context of gang, gang rape because Western feminism focus on gender alone was not enough. And so for me, it's in that space where my work more very clearly started articulating ra gender, race, sexuality, class, geography, started having a particular articulation. Um, and so I think that's where it started for me in terms of that intersectional approach. Um, and then my interest in, in further studies, my doctoral work was in sex offenders, um, incarcerated uh -huh. sex offenders. And so, of course, who's in prisons? Again, the issues of race, class, 
past geography uh, became important in, in that work, that research work. And so in many ways, those intersections have always been there, you know, and it started almost in the context of practice, so to speak, rather than in the academy or rather through writing. It actually started, it started more, yeah, in the context of practice. So for me, that's, that's always been there. Um, and because I always feel that there's a responsibility um, to sort of, I think, blur the boundaries between the academy and academic writing, um, such mm -hmm. as dissertations, master's dissertations, doctoral dissertations, and in the kind of writing we do for publication, uh, and, and living in the world, right? And so for me, um, those two always intersect. And so therefore, that's where it started for me around those intersections. And it continues in my work. Um, and so I published, I think, a, a paper on intersectionalities, uh, rethinking masculinities through the lens of intersectionality. And so that was the first chapter of my doctoral dissertation, actually. So I, I continued it, uh, you know, from starting at Rape Crisis and then continued in um, and through my publications and to the book, um, co-edited book with Nadia. And surprisingly, uh, my first book is not on gender and sexuality as center, right? Of course, it's there, but it's through that intersection. Race is actually the center. So, yeah, I mean, that's where it started for me. Okay, thank you. That's that's a wonderful exposition. Thank you very much, uh, Benita. Since you've co-edited the book together, I'm going to jump to you, Nadia, to kind of answer the same question or bring in your perspective on where feminism sits up the nexus of other forms of discrimination and, mm. and how it plays into your work. Yes, so I think um, if in in my world, when while I was growing up, I think what was significant in terms of the kinds of conversations that we had in our home was race and class. Um, and that was because of the time period in which I was growing up, which was, I was a you know, teenager in the 90s, so a child in the 80s. Um, and I think, and my family was quite, uh, I had family members who were quite active in, in the struggle in South Africa. And I think, a lot of our conversations in the home and outside of the home was about uh, race and racism and challenging the system, etc. So for me, it started with the race class stuff because of where I grew up. Um, it was, uh, you know, people, a sense of community was very, I didn't grow up in a middle class area. I grew up in a very working class community, which was subject to the Group Areas Act which was created out of the Group Areas Act. And uh, my father refused for us to move out of that area, even though there was a time in which we could have afforded to do that. He said, and I, I wrote about this um, in a paper a few years ago, where it was important for him that his children, I have a sister, um, that we remained in the area um, and we remained in this community where, where we were living so that we could learn how things work. Um, he was afraid of putting us in kind of middle class communities where we would lose some of those um, understandings of what it means to live in, in a community where people struggle. Complicated, I don't always agree with him, but, you know, I'm trying to kind of um, contextualize. I agree with him mostly, and then there's the bit where I struggle a little bit. Um, so race and class issues were always more kind of at the forefront for me. And the gender feminist theory and thinking emerged out of the race stuff. Because mm -hmm. it just made sense to me, if we're talking about race and difference and equality and discrimination um, and marginality, then we have to be talking about women's experiences. And I, like I said, I, I had a sister. So we were girls growing up in the community in which I spoke about. And I mean, we were surrounded by different kinds of men. Um, you know, I've, I always think to myself, I'm quite streetwise in terms of the ways I engage different kinds of men because I grew up with scholars on the one hand, scholars in my community, and I grew up with um, professionals, you know, men who were doctors, etc. And so my interest in masculinities also emerged out of, I think, firstly, my relationship with my father which is because masculinities is about gender. So the masculinity stuff came out of the feminist stuff because sometimes I'm quite critical of South African feminism. I'm a critical of all feminism. I'm critical of everything. So it's not feminism that I'm only critical of, but I am quite critical of South African feminisms. 
and where we are when we talk about gender, what we are actually talking about. I mean, and feminisms need to be evolving all the time. So that I think those critiques are important. So um, I worked at the Human Sciences Research Council with Benita actually um, for a long time. Um, and at the Human Sciences Research Council, you know, you have to find money in order to run projects. Um, and that wasn't very, I didn't feel really good about that. But um, the point I'm trying to make is that there we also were dealing, when we had some good research projects, we were dealing with um, communities where you would um, engage people as a participant researcher in terms of going out and um, doing research and the kinds of relationships you have with people. And intersectionalities just naturally come from an understanding of, when you watch people as an ethnographer, um, which I, I regard myself very much as an ethnographer, the older I'm getting, the more I'm thinking that's actually where I write from, from watching. COVID was hard for me precisely because I couldn't go outside and I couldn't see what people were doing. You know, I was like, I need to see what you're doing so I have something to write about because I can't sit in front of a computer and be in an individualist mode and just make things up from my head. I don't, I always had a problem with that kind of northern theoretical way that people do research and write. So a lot of the northern work is about sitting as an individual scholar, not only male scholars, female scholars too now, sitting and then producing research from... from uh, yes, much, yeah. And then it's called objective, by the way, it's called objective, but you're doing it on your own. So it's a, um, for me, what's, what's quite important. Yeah, COVID was hard because I couldn't go outside. So it's about, about um, the intersectionality. It's really about watching how a full human being engages in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I continue doing that kind of work. I like to watch people and write about other people. Wonderful. I'd like to interrogate a little bit later. We have time. Uh, your your critiques of South African feminism or feminism particularly. I think I could sure. go. I got myself into hot water. Hot water there, Nadine. I got myself. Let's go over to to the US now with Oksana because I think what you've been saying about an ethnographic slant and and um, you know inherent patriarchies and growing up with different modes of masculinities masculinity examples around you um, talks very much to Oksana's work and what she calls traditional patriarchy and traditional femininity. Um, so Oksana, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. This is a great pleasure to be here. So, uh, yes, when I uh, grew up, Soviet Union still st stood. So I am a, a product of Soviet Union. I was 17 when it fell apart. So I basically uh, grew up with it uh, and uh, uh, was formed by it. And uh, it's strange because Soviet Union proclaimed that men and women are equal and classes don't exist. We are building this classless society where everyone's going to be so equal and nothing could be further from the truth. I know when I came to the States, uh, people here, even feminists would ask me, oh, but you come from such great country. You guys could had women go to work and have careers and I'm, well, you know, it's not quite like that. It just meant that women carried the double burden and were constantly in the double bind. Now they had to uh, be at work and do make some, not even career, but just have a job. But also they had to do all the homemaking and serving men and so on and so forth. So in a way, uh, gender became class. It's a marker of class. If you're a woman, you're a second class citizen. You are kind of, you're never going to be in charge of things. It was very rare that a woman would occupy an important post there. Uh, women's health was not attended to the way it needed to be attended. Their specific needs not addressed. Basically, in the highest echelon of power, there was one woman who was minister of culture, and we never heard what her voice sounded like even. Like everybody else was men dressed in, in gray and even of the same height. So it's like a bunch of men who look the same, like with the same face. And all were always the age of, you know, something like 60, which means they couldn't relate to the issues of young people or, or the issues of women in terms of specifically women's health or protection of motherhood and so on and so forth. So, um, and then the other discourse that I want to mention would be colonialism slash imperialism, because 
uh, Ukraine and Russia were in that relationship where Russia as an empire would colonize the lands that it grabbed from around itself. I know this differs from the definition of colonialism that is most familiar to the world where the European powers would take colonies overseas. Uh, this is not an overseas colonialism, but more like neighbor colonialism. So, and uh, this, uh, this is oppressive, not just on the level of gender, but on all levels. And it's, you know, something that you grow up not quite knowing, but your parents whispering around and you know that uh, some of uh, people you know has been to, have been to jail or to the camps in Siberia and so on and so forth. And then there would be the whole bunch of historic issues that would not be spoken about at all. Uh, so uh, I think that's another important um, point of oppression or axis of oppression that uh, formed my uh, my interest in feminism and uh, all kinds of liberation because colonialism also tends to be kind of like gendered institution, except that it's not just always because it oppresses women more, but because it doesn't operate with the same gender terms in the same way that uh, they should exist in a free world. It sort of like d makes everybody disempowered. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I address okay. this still in my fiction and in some of my academic work. Right, so, so that sounds very much like it intersects or parallels our experiences here, both uh, under apartheid, as Nadia was saying, growing up and, and now in the, in the post-apartheid. Um, uh, society. Um, Nadine, uh, Oksana has touched on um, issues of health discrimination, and that's where you really come into your own. So if you want to like, want to speak to that, um, that, that question of feminism intersecting with other forms of discrimination, but particularly from the healthcare perspective, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, well, Oksana mentioned the word disempowerment, and it struck something with me just immediately. Um, you know, where my work starts, I think, is a little bit different um, from the, the norm, the average. But I came from a family that, you know, we talk about race, we talk about class and all of those things. But who even for the working class people of Cape Town under apartheid were quite disenfranchised even more than other places. So I'm from Hanover Park, which everyone knows as a place where there's just violence. You know, we grew up with army tanks in our parks and things, you know, the, that's the sort of, you know, it's like a war zone. That's what it is. And, you know, being in that space, also coming from a family who weren't afforded education, my grandmother was essentially a slave and she was owned by a white family. And this being so close in, in you know, kind of the generation that I'm from, it wasn't something that we spoke of that was so far removed. I mean, my grandmother is still alive today. And so I think for my first 14 years of life, I already understood all of these strange things that no one ever really spoke to me about, but I just questioned and couldn't understand. And, you know, as one of those children that, you know, people would complain about and say, oh, she's a checkerbox, you know, uh, because I questioned everything and I wanted to answer this to everything. But so when I turned 14 on the birthday, I actually I was going to celebrate my 13th, 14th birthday. I ended up in the hospital. And I think that's when my activism started. Um, it just was an organic thing. And I had started working since then. So often when I tell them, oh, I have 15 years experience, they look at me like I'm insane. <laughs> but they don't know that I've been working since 14. Um, you know, in the public health care system, especially in day hospitals, which is common, you know, in, in townships, you are so disenfranchised that you keep your mouth shut because speaking up for yourself or your child might deem it necessary to not take care of that person because they've spoken up. And I saw firsthand what class, race, gender, sexuality, even occupation could do to your life in that system. 
And I found myself advocating, not just for myself, but for other people when I would see this. I think the, the most profound example of this was, um, you know, seeing nurses, you know, think to me first and, you know, I'm okay, but someone else is screaming pain, but they'd administer pain medications to me first instead of that person. And they would very loudly in front of everyone speak about how this person, um, you know, didn't have foot sickness, so guard sickness. They had um, fail sick, which would mean a STD or an STI. And therefore, they could punish that person by not giving them medication immediately for pain, and they would tend to everyone else first. And I started to speak up in that moment because I realized what was happening, and I realized that something needed to be done, that person couldn't speak for themselves. And I, just in questioning, it made them uncomfortable enough to be like, you know, let me just mosey on over and give this woman medication because this little girl is asking questions that I can't answer. Mm -hmm. And that kind of also then kind of spread out into my HIV AIDS advocacy and also um, sex work advocacy. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where the intersections meet for me. Okay, great. Thank you. That that sounds fantastic. And and for somebody so young to have done so much, I'm very impressed. Um, I know you've also used, uh, and, and this is an interesting term for me, you've also used the term medical gaslighting in your work previously. I came across that online and, and I found that terminology particularly interesting. So perhaps a bit later you could speak to that. Um, but to, sure. to bring you back into one another's work, from this brief introduction to one another, is there uh, any any questions you'd like to ask of each other? I'm going to go back to Nadia just now with that interrogation of South African feminisms, which I find quite intriguing. Um, but if there's anything that's come up for you, please, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask one another or talk to one another. I mean, I'm interested in all asking Nadine around, I suppose, positioning as working class and how that, what that has meant for you in terms of South African feminisms um, and an African feminisms to center class. Um, what does that mean for you in terms of your feminist engagement? Um, this is an interesting question because I think that, you know, the background I came from, no one I knew finished school. So these weren't questions that I could ask anyone. There wasn't anyone that I could go to and say, I'm puzzled by this. So I kind of observed from a young age and kind of what the, the working class um, aspect to this race and class brought in for me was just the understanding that some people are excluded or pushed out um, from the same time into the margins even further than other people who may very really well look like them or come from communities similar to them. But that even within those communities, you know, on the fringes of society, as people would say, even in those communities, there were people who were, quote unquote, not as, you know, well off as the next person. And so I think that that trying to wrap my brain around that and not having any um any way to go any sounding board sorry any sounding board by that yeah no <laughs> not at all um kind of forced me to have to make it up as I went along and just hope that um it makes sense so yeah it's it's a it's a good question and I think that it's 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 eye-opening because I think sometimes we speak of things, um, even in feminism or in intersectionality, we speak of things as kind of this equal playing field in terms of if you are a woman and you're Black and you're from a township and you don't read, your life is this way. But that's not always the case. And that's not always um, what that scenario looks like. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Nadine. Um, Oksana, I'm quite interested to follow on on what Nadine's just said. Um, how how would the experience of a young Ukrainian woman um, from a working class background play 
you know, looking at or interested in or activist around feminism play out in Ukrainian society now? Um, well, uh, as things, are, things, things right now, of course, have changed drastically for what existed when, uh, when I was uh, young. Uh, the problem with the Soviet Union was that it proclaimed that everyone's equal and erased class, but what it achieved at doing is that everyone was equally poor, but, but not everybody was equally educated or uneducated. So uh, this is again something that my American friends always ask, like, "Oh, you must come from rich family because you're educated." I'm like, "No, uh, <laughs> Soviet Union had free education, but uh, that didn't really translate into any social power because it, it never had any financial power." So if you have ever had a chance to read Orwell, 1984, it's kind of like there was a party and there was an inner party, and then there was everybody else. So it's only the inner parties that lived well, uh, no matter what ethnicity uh, they were. And um, uh, of course, after the fall of the Soviet Union, things changed quite a bit. And now we have a pretty strong feminist lobby. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, there, there's, some, there, there's a lot of progress. Unfortunately, uh, since the war started, uh, things have changed again because the people who are refugees and who have to get their kids out of the country are usually women, which normally means now they're single-handedly responsible for these women. And uh, their own career is on hold. There's no resources suddenly for them to pursue their own even job sometimes. And if, for example, the child had any kind of special needs, that became even harder because you have to suddenly recreate all of this routine in another country. So um, Ukrainian writer Oksana Zabushko was saying that the war threw us back into some sort of very primordial uh, you know, lifestyle where uh, it's not the society of a modern type anymore. It's again back to the cave, literally, where women are just uh, maintaining this family going physically and are responsible for these kids. So, or they're working themselves to death on several jobs. I have friends who live in immigrant shelters abroad. I have friends who just rent a room at some other family and this family, though sympathetic, does not understand their situation and lectures them on how to be a good mother. So it's all these horror stories that we hear every day. Yes, uh, I, I think that that's a lot of immigrants uh, and particularly women in, in immigrant or migrating populations is largely still under research, just from my own work around Sub-Saharan Africa. Oksana Zabushko was the, the other Oksana I interviewed last year for the time as a writer. So I saw that quote of hers recently, and it's an interesting one. She's, she's essentially claiming that the war has set the Ukraine back about 50 years, as it were. Um, yeah. Ravi, coming coming to you now. I don't know whether you you're prepared to to answer the hot water question. Hot water also being the title of Nadine's book. I know um, I was being facetious earlier. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. Do you well, want to, do you want yeah first, I want to just say you? to both. Um, it's Nadine, not Nadine. Nadine. Uh, I asked her. She said Nadine. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um. And Okshana, I mean, for me, this whole question about how working class communities operate in different spaces with all the other intersections of war, your kind of war, you, what's happening in Ukraine, what has happened in Ukraine, um, and also um, an overpark, you said an overpark, right? And yeah. what and that kind of different kind of war. Yeah. Now all those intersections of of war and um, and race and gender, how they intersect, and how how those intersections then look in real life for people, and how they are able to live. You know, um, I think that we don't speak about what's happening in um, working class communities in the South African context, at least enough. Um, in the U.S., there's some material, there's some research that, that gets conducted on working class communities that I found quite useful um, and how it intersects usually with race. Um, and so there's, you know, lots of um, material on the experience of 
experiences of black Americans, working class black Americans in different spaces now, um, in the contemporary moment. But in South Africa, we just don't get to the class stuff enough. We talk about poverty, but we don't really dissect that. So what does it mean? And I think Okshana was talking about that a little bit. What does it mean when we talk about poverty? How, how do we measure? I mean, we have numbers for what things look like um, in quantitative terms. But when we talk about poverty, do we understand that poverty has different layers? And that when we are, when we read the news, local news, at least in the Western Cape context, I can, I, I only speak, I, I try to speak from the local because I know I'm more familiar with it. I can make connections, but that local um, understanding is very much tied to the fact that, I mean, there's like men, young men getting shot every week, mm -hmm. getting killed and shot, innocent or not innocent. They, um, People are, are hurt every single week and we're not having open discussions about what that means. What does it mean? What does it say? So when we have these large theories on masculinities, mm -hmm. Anita and I talk about this all the time. When we have these large theories and masculinities, what does that mean? Can we talk about what it means? When we have these large theories on gender-based violence, um, it's easier to understand what that means because there's been a lot of research on gender-based violence. Benita might disagree about certain aspects that has been left out of, but in my understanding, there's been a lot of research on gender-based violence. Um, I'm interested in, if we change the words a little bit, if we take words out and add other words, let's look at gender violence and then let's try to see what that could constitute. What does that mean? So yes, there's violence against women, and the rates are exceptionally high. This violence against children, it's something I can't even begin to fathom or talk about. It's not something I want to spend my time engaging in because it's too hard. People are doing that. People are doing the work. Um, but violence against children is a whole other thing. But what is, what's happening, if that's the kind of way that people are, that, the kind of place that we live in, places throughout the world, then, mm -hmm. you know, um, what kinds of questions are we not asking? So when I say that I'm critical of South African, all feminisms, not only South African feminisms, and the South African feminisms, I want to say that I know that we are all doing our best. First, I mm. want to start by saying, I'm not, my, the point I'm trying to make is not that feminists are not doing enough. We are working within systems that are so hard to change. And so we, you know, we make a couple of steps forward and then leaps backwards because these systems are strong. Patriarch, patriarchies are, are well structured, they're systemic, they have a place in the world. And so, yes, the primary way that we the primary way that we are trying to understand gender and race and violence and so on is by looking at the patriarchies and looking at the ways in which we can dismantle, change, work against. I'm also interested in, um, because feminisms are not free of bias and they're not free of power. And we've had major problems in terms of who holds the knowledge and who defines what gets said. So we know the old arguments about white feminisms uh, from the North and then in South Africa, which is still very much at play, white feminisms, so they've got a place, they're more located, they're more, um, they're more firmly, firmly, not firmly fixed, but they they have a place um, in ways that other feminisms don't. They've been so better articulated, perhaps, Nadia? It articulated, had more time and, of course, more resources, right? So now we have, um, so there's all sorts of questions about power that I'm interested in when it comes to feminist knowledges in South Africa. But there's a question around gender for me and class and race and the way they intersect that I find is not useful in terms of these grand intersectional theories. These theories are large and they just, they can't, they can't hold everything. They can't. And so when we talk about intersectionality or teams, mm -hmm patriarchy, which seems to be a very common way of talking about, about um, male control and dominance and so on, is by saying patriarchy. When the patriarchies look 
very different depending on where you stand in terms of race and class. So for me, the patriarch is not the same as for maybe another kind of feminist. And so my, are there ways in which feminisms can come together and in which we can engage? Yes, they are. But I, I'm a little bit critical of the idea that, you know, all women are nice and we're all together and we're all working towards the same goal. I don't think that's true. I don't think it's true. I don't feel that all feminists, all feminists are held in the same way by this big feminist movement. I think that um, you, you have to, the fight kind of continues. So in terms of gender, um, I'm interested in talking about, can we think about what gender means and not always use Judith Butler to understand what gender means? How do we understand gender differently? And that's where stories and fiction so much more useful than the social science theories could ever be because the ways in which gender is engaged in story opens up a whole different way of understanding relationships to patriarchies the way race and class intersect skewly they don't intersect evenly obviously and all the other sexualities ability um all the other stuff so for me um i found that I mean, I move between the social sciences and I move between the literary, different literary and cultural studies worlds. But for me, if I were to look for theories on um, gender, I'm going to look at Octavia E. Butler rather oh. than Judith Butler. You know oh. what I'm saying? Because Octavia E. Butler, as a black science fiction writer, mm -hmm. has broken back. She was doing the work. <laughs> she was doing the work. And then, of course, um, um, last night's conversation, of course, between those two marvelous people. The theories were there long ago, like Benita was saying. You know, it was being written in stories for for decades. And so oh, I just yeah. think, yeah. So I'm kind of when I say I'm critical, I'm I, I think I'm being I'm learning to be more productively critical rather than saying that doesn't work for me. Although I sometimes also do that. But I, I think we need an openness rather than a closing down in terms of um, we always need to be thinking about what works for us, what, what, which feminist theories are, are failing and why are they failing? Who, is, who, who are the people articulating them? And should we be looking at the fiction that's emerging or biographies or autobiographies in which race, gender, class, sexuality and all those things are layered and complex and dirty it's dirty work it's not just see i can go on and on so i'm going to stop okay well <laughs> I, I think that's fabulous I, I agree with you that you know there isn't just one feminism it's not a one size fits all um you know category by by any means and also that it's a very very evolving field a uh, constantly evolving field and I think also that the, the, the dynamics, the power dynamics at play are no longer just between black and white in terms of race or mm. um, you know, working class versus middle class in terms of class, etc. There are kind of sub intersectionalities within those as well, where different differential power dynamics play a huge role. And I'm very interested to hear your theory on story because I'm working with a group of women currently, I'm a writing coach as well, and I'm working with a group of women, many of whom have never written before, and who came into this process saying, I'm not a writer. Mm. And yet they're storytellers, and they all have valuable stories to tell. So um, and I'm really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited by your vision of, of storytelling as a vehicle for directing feminist studies um, and, and mm. feminist research in this country. I think it's a very interesting and, and cutting edge type of methodology. And, and I'm actually working with a project at UCT on that at the moment. So um, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, coming, coming to, I'd like to bring in some members of the audience or the, the public. And I see that we have a couple of notes in the chat here. Oh, well, one of them is from Nadine. And Nadine says, oh, I love that question. I can't remember which question that was. Hold that thought, Nadine. And then there's a question here from Janine Pretorius uh, on YouTube. 
How do you interact with colored identity, if at all? Does it dissolve into blackness or coexist with blackness? Is it important to you, any of you, to highlight colored complexity amidst other identities? And this is specifically directed at Benita, Nadia, and Nadine. <laughs> um, if I can go ahead. So, so the question that I said I loved was that question, actually. Um, how much time do you have, Janine? <laughs> um, you know, I think <laughs> I think that um, my feelings around this is obviously conflicting, and I think that others might look at me and go, "That's madness," and you know, you are completely off. You know, and that's okay. Um, but to be honest with you. In one word, it's just tired. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of acting with it. I'm tired. Of it. Just I'm tired of it. And the reason why I'm tired of it is because I find oftentimes the conversations are draining, and you have to go there again and again, and that can be exhausting. But you know, when you ask about does it dissolve into blackness, I think this is why my um, why I, I'm talking about being tired, right? Because when we talk about colored identities, I think what people forget is that oftentimes when when we um, talk about it, they are referring to what people would identify as quote unquote okay, colored people. And I find that it can often be almost hierarchical in the, in that there's this notion that you know there are types of colored and they are better versions of this thing so if you are quote unquote you know cape malay you are better than the this and that and whatever and so that's the first part of why i absolutely just hate it and the second bit is that i think oftentimes it, the conversation can quickly go to a place that's anti-black mm -hmm. and because of that um, i steer clear for me, colored identity doesn't necessarily have to dissolve into anything. I just prefer to just say I'm black, and that's it. But the complex that's how most of us identified in uh, under apartheid. Uh, but but the the apartheid labels of colored Indian etc. are now being used within the greater black community as. Um, identifiers but also markers of difference mm. uh, mm. just to, to highlight for you you may be used to the term colored people in the u.s referring to all people of color in south africa because of our unique history we were almost segmented to be pitted against one another amongst black people so you know we were identified as as being of asian ancestry so indian or colored as being mixed mixed identity, usually a mix of black and white or other, um, and then ethnically African um, identified as black. But as I said, under apartheid, we all used this, we consciously tried to, uh, you know, steer away from the apartheid terminology and, and identify as black. So I'm interested that somebody of Nadine's age is actually saying that's where she prefers to go. Mm. But I think, to be honest, I think there are a lot of people my age are, are going there, right? Because for us, coloredness has been a burden to carry. And it's kept us from interacting with people who are, you know, just across the way. And the, the way I've always, you know, to explain this to people is that if you think about Cape Town and you think about um, places like Manenberg and Kuguletu, a road separates it, but we will uh, try and make our identity so different from each other because we don't want to be that thing, right? So where I grew up, we would refer to it as a Wendy house when a colored person had it, but in a black person had it, it's a shack. And when you think about, um, you know, things like we talk about the Cape Flats or, yeah, we talk about the Cape Flats generally, um, and that's for colored people. And when we talk about a space with black people, like we say the township. So, you know, those sorts of little things is why I'm just like, no, I don't have 
the Tamil effort and I draw the just the black and everything. And, you know, it's not that it's unimportant to me or that I feel like highlighting um, color writing is, isn't important. I just feel that it can be a way to create further division amongst ourselves and it can be a way for us to perpetrate violence towards people who are different to us. And because of that, I would, from my point of view at least, I just strip it all away and say, I'm black, that's it, we'll leave it there. We don't have to, you know, um, go into the the politics of trying to say, well, who had it worse or who am I judging? Who am I better than? So yeah, it feels a little bit more equal. Yeah, and what are the implicit class identifiers in in self-identifying as colored or brown? And I, I saw an interesting tweet by Barbara Boswell recently um, saying that she's increasingly seeing this terminology of brown people in the media and, and wanting to know whether it's being imposed by the media or whether it's coming from within communities. Benita, Nadia, if you want to jump in there on this question of colored identity and brownness uh, versus black, um, I know you address it in the introduction to your book as well. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about the introduction to the book. I will leave that to Nadia if she wants to go there. She might also be tired of answering that question. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think similarly to Nadine, you know, in terms of identifying, for me, I'm I, I'm beginning to ask the question of who's asking the question, mm -hmm. right? Because the person, and this is not necessarily to the person who asked the question in this moment, but is what is their purpose? The purpose of the the question right what's the intention of the question what is that person's understanding and definitions of racism and anti-blackness mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i'm i'm beginning to engage it from the place of where it's coming rather than saying oh this is only about me because it's not only about me it's about the languaging and it's about the articulation of racism in different sort of moments and time periods in different places so who's asking the question and for what purpose you know so i think i'm becoming a little bit more sort of cautious and cynical about who's asking the question. So for example, if it's the students in the classroom asking the question, and I engage with it very differently, right? Mm -hmm. To being on a panel and then a white person asking me that question. So yeah. students asking the question, it's about access to discourses and languaging around race and anti-racism. And so I engage it differently. And I talk about identifying as black and my own experience because of that. But I also talk about being read and marked. Nadia often likes to use this word marked. Our bodies are marked, right? and talk about sort of social practices that will be read as colored. Of course, I grew up in a group areas act, uh, or through the group areas act in terms of a time um, of apartheid. So I grew up in Woodstock, not um, very dissimilar to Hanover Park, although in some ways similar, um, different to Hanover Park. But I understand what that means, those experiences mean, because my family lived in Hanover Park. Actually, I went to church in Hanover Park, you know? And so, um, so for me, in terms of languaging, it's about access and enabling conversations between different, often generations of people around race, racism in South Africa and beyond. Um, and that's when I have the conversation. But when it's white people asking the conversation, I'm like, why are you asking this in this way? You know, what, mm. what have you not read? What do you need to still learn? Um, rather than asking me questions that could be divisive and could be for another right. gender. Mm -hmm. right. Well, I think that question has actually steered us away from the theme of this uh, this discussion. So bringing it back to feminist perspectives, uh, we've got, I think, just over about 12 minutes uh, to, to the end of this panel. So I'd like to steer it back towards the feminist conversations, if we can. And um, I see there aren't any other questions on the chat. But I am going to bring it back to your book, because I do think it's a beautiful book. Um, and, and I'd like for you to talk about your book a little bit as well, your books a little bit as well, Oksana and, and uh, Nadine. But this particular book, what intrigues me is that you talk about an imagined vision of the future um, that values intellectual knowledges of women of color. Um, you know, and, and you use that term, I think, quite consciously intellectual knowledges that values intellectual knowledges of women of color, uh, which has traditionally been, or in this country has been undervalued. And Nadia, do you want to comment on that at all? Um, yes, so um, it, 
it's obviously it's also related to the previous question. I don't want to get stuck there mm -hmm. either. Um, but the term women of color is something I, I feel is useful in certain ways and questionable in others. Um, but I'm, I must say I'm really tired of, of how we talk about these particular markers of racial identity and who it includes and who it excludes. And it's becoming more and more exclusive because when people are desperate to eat, when people don't have jobs, they're going to tie themselves to identities that's going to allow them some movement. Um, and so I, I, I just, I find it quite, um, strange uh you know the students at Stellenbosch University are kind of very much situated within this whole idea of colored identities and all of them seem to think they can come to me for supervision <laughs> and I'm like what makes you think I know about colored identities because you're assuming that I identify in a certain way but there's a movement at least at Stellenbosch around colored identities that I haven't seen at UCT and at um, in the Western Cape. And then, of course, at the University of the Western Cape itself, there is other kinds of issues around the race there and um, which might allow more space, actually, for a discussion of, of what it means to be black. Um, I've been using the term, the phrase people of color more and more. Mm -hmm. because it ties me to other people and it ties us all to others it doesn't just keep us stuck in Cape Town or in Durban or in um I can't say Austin Texas and I can't say the Ukraine oh, perhaps um, because that's somewhere you go to in, in your book at least because I'm saying can we connect to what's happening in Palestine can we connect to what's happening in parts of India can we please make connections outside of our own locatedness because when we get stuck with terms like colored which is a very south african term because of apartheid etc and we get stuck with our idea of blackness here which and like i said earlier the local is very important but it must never be disconnected from what's happening globally so what's happening in other spaces how can we talk about race across those spaces so in terms of looking at a future for for feminist um thinking feminist writing we we it's very clear that women of color struggle in different ways to um, publish their work, um, to if they want to get MAs or PhDs. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the same for other women. Uh, and so a future that values feminist thinking for women of color means that we're going to go to places where we are going to in this conversation because of where women of women of color emerge from the kinds of backgrounds they have they have new theories theories that talk against the canonical feminist theories that exist in the world so for us at least in the book it was very important um, that we had uh, women of color telling us what they think about racism telling us what they think about intersections and what um and you know that kind of um it just seems quite clear that that is what needs to happen as we move forward um we need to put support structures in place mm -hmm. we need to have funding in place to make that happen otherwise what kind of theories are we we can't still be stuck in the past i mean we have a long way to go in terms of we look in terms of south african feminist theory we have a few writers who are writing prolifically and that is fantastic few women of color and they're writing prolifically, and that is amazing. I can only imagine what kind of things had to be sacrificed for women of color to produce that kind of work so regularly. What sacrifices had to be made? Um, because it's not the same when you live in an individualist society. Um, it's different when you work, when you're part of a collective, you're part of a community. If my family and my friends are not doing well, I'm not doing well. So I can't be sitting alone in a room writing about how I'm not feeling well, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that for us, the intellectual work of women of color, we need to see more of it. We need to give them the money to do the work because some of them do not have the money. Um, 
And so when I was listening to um, the writer last night, um, Magona. Magona. when I was listening to her, um, she, she was, she, she said so, so many amazing things, but one of it was about, she just kept going despite raising three children when she was 23 years old and her husband had left. She just kept going. She kept writing. I don't know how she did it because then I, I would kind of crawl into a corner and then hope somebody, somebody just comes to give me some support and then I can get up and I can go again. But yeah. to see this person saying, to hear her saying at 80 that independence is one of the biggest things that you can, the largest things that you, that you can have in order to give you the space to think and produce. Now, we all know that's not always possible, especially for women of color. What does independence mean? Yeah. Um, we have different cultural um, 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 responsibility. Yeah. yeah, but she still, she left no space for excuses. She was like, despite all of that, you need to keep, I just kept going. And she's just got a new book coming out, you know? Um, so I guess, yeah. For us, uh, I'm speaking for Benita, but Benita can add, I mean, we discussed it when we put it in the book. We, um, money for women of color, very clear, they need more money. Yes. They need to be funded properly. Um, they need support, writing retreats where we can write and we can produce and someone can take care of our children if we decided to have them, or even if we didn't decide to have them, but they're there mm -hmm. nonetheless. Someone's got to take care of them. Someone's got to help us do that so that we can continue the work. So um, money, we need money and we know there's money. There are money in the institutions. The publishers have money. We know what we're doing. We write great things when given the opportunity under mm -hmm. very difficult conditions. Please just give us the money. <laughs> money matters. <laughs> money matters. Um, I'm, I'm going to move over to Oksana because this, this yeah. last bit of the conversation really kind of been very locally said, but I think what Margaret said about being outward thinking as well as in the local is so important. And so, Oksana, in terms of a last thought on feminist perspective um, in your work and in your milieu, both in the US as a Ukrainian living there and also in your home country, um, what, what are the thoughts you'd like to leave this panel with? Yes, uh, thank you so much. This is very interesting to listen to. I'm actually kind of a misfit because uh, when I came to the United States, I did women and gender studies for one of my MAs, which means I studied, uh, you know, I, 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 knew, I know the basic concept and I actually wrote a big article about Black Lives Matter for Ukrainian audience when it was going on in the United States because from from Ukraine, it was not obvious what was going on. It's kind of like the Soviet Union never really gave you that knowledge and Ukraine didn't have time to catch up and give you this knowledge. And during, according to Soviet ideology, you know, that everyone was liberated and there's nothing to protest about. What's there to protest about? So there was never this concept that people actually liberated themselves. It's not like some good uncle came and liberated everybody. So, and when it comes to the intersections of uh, race with class and everything else, that again, that's not necessarily obvious on another continent. So I, um, I was happy to, uh, to be able to do this work. So, and um, uh, there were so in many interesting thoughts and so many insights about the condition of poverty also, and I could probably talk about that. But um, let me just say this, that uh, the novel in question that we were uh, that we were discussing at the beginning, um, I don't know how that novel would look like now, because it's kind of like it was written in 2019 and finished and published. And uh, since then, so many things happened in the world and in Ukraine. So now post post pandemic, what pandemics did to feminism? I mean, I see my colleagues even in the United States, if they are women, Somehow they're expected to teach this, we're expected to teach the Zoom classes with their kids like around them and because daycare doesn't work. So it's all the women academics were saying that that really threw them years back. Um, so and um, then, of course, what happened in Ukraine changed 
I, I sometimes feel like I woke up into a different world and I don't know what my, where my bearing is. Like all the series I knew don't work the way I thought they should work. So what you were saying uh, about uh, new series, not just very relevant uh, to many people right now and to many women in Ukraine as well, because um, again, it's, uh, it's not configured the way we thought it would be. So in my novel, I talk about recent events in history, in Ukrainian history. It's basically the end of the Soviet Union transition to a different society, post-totalitarian society. And about one of the student protests that set the tone for the two upcoming revolutions, except that usually people hear about the other two revolutions of 2004 and 2013, 14, because already Facebook was invented and it was kind of available more as knowledge. But this happened in um, 1990, and it was called Revolution on the Granite. And it was actually you know, young people, students who were uh, who were having a hunger strike, demanding basically the dissolution of the Soviet Union, which did happen pretty soon after that. And uh, I do talk about the issue of uh, where where women's place is in nationalist struggle. Uh, where, and I use the word here positive connotation as kind of like national self-identification uh, that it's still uh, it would I mean there, there would still be attempt to marginalize that because women should be just protectors of the hearse and symbols of the nation rather than anything else but then again uh, this war came and changed everything I knew about men women history and myself and we not right now have uh, met more women in combat in military forces than probably any country in the world and we see uh, just unbelievable examples of all kinds of changes and actually very, we should say feminist changes, strangely, but war pushed our society in Ukraine to be more feminist. Wow, okay. All right, thank you very much for that, uh, Oksana. I, said, I certainly am looking forward to reading Ivan and Phoebe and also Hot Water and to finishing this, this lovely volume. Um, any last thoughts, Nadine, uh, and particularly perhaps a little bit of a pitch for hot water? We literally have <laughs> asked for time, but maybe just one minute. Okay. Um, you know, so I think, I think it's a book that everyone should read. Um, not just women, but everyone should read. Because I think it gives insights into how these different intersections and these different systems often all, in my opinion, lead to the same place. And that is potential disability of some sort. And that is my story. That is where, you know, where, it doesn't matter what the intersection is, whether it's class, gender, whatever bias there is, the fact that that can tip the, the you know, tip whatever into a disability is kind of what I want to showcase and I want to talk about. I don't think we've spoken about women and disability enough. Um, and I want to just remind everyone that that's what hot water is about. It's about, you know, finding myself in these situations that got me into trouble, but good trouble, you know? So uh -huh. I, like that. I like that, getting into good trouble. Maybe that's a starting point for, for a new kind of, of uh, feminist theorizing, getting into good trouble. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank you all for being here. I'm sorry we're out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get more questions from the audience. I hope there was an audience uh, on Facebook uh, Live and on YouTube. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for engaging with me and with one another. And look forward to reading your books and chatting with you perhaps in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks, and Aisha. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Nadine, I'm looking very forward to that book and your book. I want all the books. Can't you send us the books when they're yes. available?